Thank you for joining me for another video from Grow and Give, a modern victory garden project brought to you by CSU Extension. Grow and Give videos will help you learn to grow food, share the harvest, and keep it local. In this video about berries for the Colorado garden, we're going to cover a lot of different types, including strawberries, raspberries and blackberries, blueberries, currants, gooseberries, jostaberries, and grapes. This video is a complete version of a live webinar, complete with discussion and question and answer session. If you'd like to learn about each of the individual topics listed without watching the full webinar, you can find the shorter versions on the Grow and Give website. Great, can you see my presentation okay? Great, all yeah. right. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video just to allow for better bandwidth. All right. So yeah, today we're gonna to talk about growing small fruits in Colorado. Um, as Allison mentioned before I moved out here about four years ago, um, I was working in Kentucky and I was managing a, a fruit farm, part of what my job was anyway, I was managing a fruit farm. And, and there we grew uh, mostly tree fruits of apples, but we also grew a lot of blueberries. And then prior to that, I actually worked for the University of Kentucky as a research analyst for their fruit and vegetable program. And so I was able to get involved in a lot of really fun projects. Um, we grew blackberry variety trials, raspberries, blueberries, um, did some work with grapes, and then also some production systems for strawberries. So I've definitely been able to at least get my feet wet in a lot of these different types of fruit uh, growing opportunities. So I would like to share that with you today. So let me see how I advance my slide here. There we go. All right, so today in this class, we are gonna cover the following fruits, hopefully. If I have enough time, we'll get to all of these. Um, we're gonna start out going in depth in strawberries and raspberries, because I think those are probably two of the most popular ones we grow here. We'll touch on blackberries, blueberries, currants, um, gooseberries, and josta berries, and then we'll end things out today with grapes. If you have questions, um, go ahead and put those in the chat box. Tony and Allison can try to answer those as they can, um, but if not, we're gonna stop after each, each section and I'll take a few questions. So let's start with strawberries. So strawberries have an interesting history. Uh, they were actually first grown in France, but they were grown from plants that were brought over from the Americas. So the strawberries that you get today, these Fregaria uh, ananasa types, are actually hybrids between the American Virginiana strawberries and then the Chile strawberries or Chiloensis, which is kind of cool to know that they were first grown in Europe of plants that were brought from America. So I, I don't know, I find that in very interesting history. Um, as far as the fruit itself, the berry is actually an enlarged flower receptacle. The fruits are the seeds, the, and I'm putting air quotes around that, I know you can't see me, but the seeds on the outside of the fruit there is so those are called akines. So let's just look at the strawberry botany of the actual plant. So you've got, these are pretty small plants. You've got a leafy top and then you've got your root system at the bottom. That area right where those two meet is called the crown. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more when we talk about planting strawberries because that crown is really important um, when you're planting. And then, you know, with strawberries, you actually get these um, little stems of sorts that come off, and those are what we call stolons or runners, and those runners will produce daughter plants. Strawberries can be put into three different main categories. So we've got June bearing, ever bearing, and day neutral. All of these types of strawberries are perennials, and they all spread by stolons, although the June bearing tend to have a lot more stolons than the ever bearing and the day neutral. You can see from that chart there that there's also a difference in when they're flowering and fruiting. And that's really dependent a lot on daylight, hours, and temperature. Um, so they're looking for those cool temperatures, those short days, and that's gonna favor that flowering. So June bearing, the arrows there show that it really starts to produce right there at the end of June into July. Ever bearing, you're gonna get two sets of fruits. You're gonna get a, probably a June or July fruit set, and then you'll also get one at the end of the season. And then day neutral are a type of ever bearing, and they just kind of fruit throughout the season. So just a little more specifics about each type 
um, of strawberries. So let's start with the June bearing. So again, these are going to produce that one crop each year. Usually in Colorado along the Front Range, that's in July. Um, even though they're called June bearing, you know, we're a little bit later than the rest of the country. So um, the flowers are going to be set the previous fall. So kind of like lilacs or some of those other um, woody plants that you know that set their, their flowers in the year before and bloom on old wood, June bearing are like that. Um, you won't see those flowers until the spring, but they do get set back in the fall. June bearings typically have larger fruits and higher yields, and they're also thought, you know, said to be the most flavorful and the most aromatic of the strawberries. Um, you know, there's been breeding done, so that may be a little different for different varieties. Uh, let's see, so they also tend to be less hardy in Colorado due to that springtime temperature swing that we often get in those late spring frosts, and so those flowers can get nipped. So a lot of people choose not to grow the June bearing types just for that, um, that reason. You get one shot with these in the early summer to get that, that crop. And if your flowers get nipped, you've kind of lost the crop for that year. Um, these are most popular for making jams, also really good for freezing. Um, and so we've got some uh, recommended varieties here to share with you too. Um, honey oil, uh, Guardian, Kent, Red Chief, Delight, Jewel, Masabi, AC Wendy, Cabot, and Blumadin are all good June bearing types for our areas in Colorado. You want to avoid the cultivars of Dunlap, Fairfax, Robinson, and Red Star. They're just not going to be winter hardy enough. And you guys are going to get these slides, so you'll have all of these, um, these varieties to look at later. So all the ones that are listed here have very good winter hardiness. So the next type, the everbearing, like I said, these are going to have two fruit cycles. So you'll get one in the early summer and then one again in the fall. Um, these are more reliable here in Colorado than those June bearing types. Again, just due to that tolerance to the cold weather. And then, you know, if you do get some flowers that get nipped early on in the season, you've still got that chance later on to get another crop. These plants are going to fruit lightly between heavy crops. So again, you might see a strawberry here and there in August. Um, just pick those and enjoy those. Typically speaking, these berries are going to be smaller in size than those June bearing types. Here's a, a couple good ever bearing cultivars for Colorado. A uh, very popular type is Fort Laramie, also Quinault and Ogallala. And then we have those day neutral types. Um, as I mentioned, day neutral types are actually uh, a type of everbearing, but not all everbearing strawberries are day neutral. Day neutrals are, were kind of pulled out as a subset that just happened to put out fruit um, throughout the year or throughout the growing season, I should say. Um, the blossoms on these will slow down and stop during hot weather, so just keep that in mind. And then also these plants are going to need constant light fertilization and regular removal of the runners. Um, they're just grown a little bit differently than the June bearing types. And we're going to talk a little bit about two different systems for growing these, these strawberries. The ever bearing and the day neutral, they actually do better if you remove the runners um, and, and focus in on the plant itself. These plants, these day neutral plants, are very sensitive to drought and heat. So make sure that you have good irrigation and um, that's very necessary throughout the production season. And then typically these fruits, like the other ever-bearing types, are going to be a little bit on the smaller side. So a couple of day neutral varieties that you can try in Colorado, Tribute, TriStar, and Fern. Um, I should say too that these day neutral types are often, you'll see these grown in greenhouses as well, um, in pots that are kind of hanging. And that way they can get a little bit of production um, over a good long period of time. So as far as tips for buying strawberries, um, you want to make sure that you're purchasing those plants as bare root in the early spring. Um, when you're looking at the different varieties to grow, go ahead and choose zone four just to be on the safe side. Again, um, they're going to be a little uh, marginally hardy, some of those varieties, so you want to make sure you're getting stuff that's going to make it through our winters. Um, and so a few more tips for you. I should mention as far as buying strawberries, I just bought some maybe three weeks ago. So, you know, 
it's not too terribly late. You, if you could get them in before the weekend, you might be okay for this year. I would go with the ever-bearing type. All right, a little bit about cultural requirements. You want to select a site for your strawberries that's going to have at least eight hours of sunlight. And then also you want to make sure that they're protected from the wind. Um, for your soil types, uh, just like a lot of our fruit crops, they really want a well-drained soil that's high in organic matter. If your soil is clay, you might want to consider planting these in raised beds for better drainage. And we're also going to talk about a system called the hill system, and that would probably be a better way for you to go if you have clay soil. Um, disease pressure. So uh, don't plant within four years following strawberries, raspberries, solanaceous crops, and vine crops. And the reason there is that these are in the, um, the rose family. And so there are certain soil-borne diseases like verticillium that can also affect strawberries. So always practice good crop rotation. And when you do that, switch things out between families. As far as establishment goes, these can be very fussy. And I'm gonna show you a picture in the next slide that kind of shows just how they want to be planted at the exact perfect depth. <laughs> so they are, they are a little fussy to start out with. However, once they get established, and you can see that in the lower left-hand picture there, they can be quite aggressive, especially those June bearing types that are gonna be putting out a lot of runners. So just know that. So here's that chart to show you um, just how they wanna be perfectly planted. Um, they have to be at the proper planting depth with that crown sitting just above the soil. Um, you also want to make sure when you plant these that you're fanning the roots out and getting them all the way down nice and deep and give them room to move around. If you plant them too deep, you can end up getting crown rot. If you plant them too high, they may not make it through that winter um, because that crown is too exposed. So again, just try to plant them correctly like in the first picture there. As far as mulch goes, uh, mulch is really important with strawberries. They have very shallow root systems. And again, I said that crown is very susceptible to winter damage. So make sure you're using mulch. Um, this is gonna help keep the soil moistures more consistent as well, and keep those soil temperatures um, right where the strawberries are gonna want them. It's also gonna help you with reducing weeds around your plants. Um, and you can use things like grass clippings, weed-free straw or other organic materials to mulch um, your strawberries. You can also use plastic mulch, which I'll show you uh, in the next slide. So I mentioned there's a couple different ways that you can grow, grow strawberries. Um, there's two different main systems. There's the matted row system and the hill system. Um, there's more information about how to grow in each of these systems in some of our CSU Extension publications, and I will be linking all of those when I send out your slides after class. So let's talk first. We've got the June bearers, and they prefer the matted row system. So that's the system you see on the left there, where you have these rows of strawberries and then some space in between, and you let them fill in the gaps. You let those runners go. Um, so June bearers like that system. The ever bearing and the day neutral types do better in a hill system. And this is where you really don't allow those runners to set. And so one way you can do this is to use a black plastic um, around those plants. And that will just keep those runners as they grow from, um, from you know, setting into the soil. Also, you can go through and remove those runners as you see them. And that's gonna help you get more, more of that energy focused on the, the mother plant for the ever-bearing and day-neutral types to give you better strawberries. As far as caring for your strawberries, so with the June bears, they're gonna be preferring about an inch of water per week during flowering and fruit set. So once you get that, you know, again, these are only gonna fruit that one time in July, that main, that main harvest anyway. After that, you can start to reduce the water down. Um, also, you want to wait until after they flowered and fruited to fertilize, and you want to fertilize following that cycle with what we call ammonium sulfate, and that's got a um, NPK formulation of 2100. Ammonium sulfate is very commonly used on small fruits, so um, you'll see me mention this again and again with different types of fruits. I'm hearing a little feedback, so I'm just going to make sure that everyone is muted here. 
Okay. I'm not sure where that is coming from. All right, um, a couple other things to notice about the June bears. If you start to see yellowing, this is a sign of iron chlorosis. Um, and that's usually what we see when you're overwatering those strawberries. So remember, you can back off of that water um, once they're done flowering and fruiting. Yep. All right, as far as the ever bearing and the day neutrals, um, with those, the care is just a little bit different. You want to remove the first flush of flowers on your first year plants. So I just, I told you I just planted about 10 of these. Um, they haven't started flowering yet, but I will go ahead and remove those until July 1st. And it, what's great about the Everbearing and the Day Neutrals is you actually can get a harvest that very first year with these, whereas the um, June bearers, typically you have to wait until your second year to really get a harvest. But removing those, that first flush of flowers is gonna push that plant into more vegetative growth. It's gonna give you a stronger plant. And then you can let those flowers after July 1st develop into the strawberries. Periodically throughout the season, remove the runners. Again, focusing the energy for these types back on the mother plant. And you can actually fertilize these lightly throughout the growing season, not just once, because you are getting those, those um, you know, couple different harvest periods. So for these, you can just use a quarter cup of that same ammonium sulfate per 100 square feet. Um, make sure you read the labels on your fertilizer bags um, and make sure you're applying the right amount. You definitely don't want to over fertilize. And then with these types of strawberries, you're going to want to start a new patch every three to four years. And with these types, these ever bearing and day neutral types, you're going to have to actually replant. The June bearing types, you can, um, those are managed a little bit differently. You can let the runners turn into the new plants and then remove the mother plants. So again, just a very different way of managing each system. I like to show this picture because I really would love to ride on one of these harvest machines at some point in my life. Um, I just love it. You get to lay down and then they just roll over the rows and pick strawberries. So much fun. Um, when you're picking strawberries at home, you want to make sure you're picking them every other day during the peak of the season. Um, if the berries are eaten or preserved immediately, then you can actually only harvest the red ripe fruit and you can leave that cap on the plant. It's just an easier way to harvest. Um, I don't know that I've, I haven't found anything that says that it's better for the plant or not, other than the fact that you might be pulling on the plant too much. Um, but if you're going to wait and use those fruits later in a few days, um, go ahead and harvest the cap as well. It's going to give you an extended shelf life of that fruit. And we know strawberries don't have a, a super long shelf life, so um, think about that before you uh, harvest. Um, also, you want to look for that full red color throughout the berry. Um, a lot of times they'll still be white on the backside or, or white up on the shoulders of the fruit. Um, just let those go for another day. Um, Although just make sure you're not letting that fruit rot on the vine because it, it's really poor practice to leave the fruit on the vine. So um, even the rotted fruit, you wanna pick that up from the ground. You don't wanna be luring in any critters. As far as winter care, so after you've, you've got all your berries for the season and things start to get colder, you wanna think about tucking these plants in for the winter. Um, keep that soil moist until the fall frost and then withhold some of that water and that's going to help harden off those plants. It's going to make them kind of have to toughen up um, right there before the, the freezes and frosts come in. We'll get a final November, um, we'll do a final November watering just before the soil freezes. Um, that's going to help prevent that winter kill from drying. In Colorado, we want to make sure that we are mulching these. Um, so we're going to use a mulch of some kind of seed-free straw or something similar. And you're going to cover that straw with bird netting if you're in a windy area, just to kind of keep it in place. As with all of our uh, crops and all of our plants here in Colorado, if we do get those extended periods of time where it's been um, nice and warm outside and we haven't had any snow cover, we haven't had any rain, um, maybe in the middle of February, go out there and just go ahead and give your uh, plants a nice watering to keep them happy over the winter. And then once uh, spring comes along and those temperatures start to warm up again, instead of fully removing that mulch, you're just going to kind of pull it back from where the plants are sitting. Um, you just don't want to shock them, and especially because we can get those harder frosts and freezes, and this makes it 
pretty easy to then just cover those plants right back over. Strawberries do have some pests and diseases, although I will say that in Colorado, I haven't seen these be as big of an issue um, as they are back in the Midwest and on the East Coast. But what we do get here in Colorado, which we get everywhere, are birds and rabbits and deer and other um, types of, of rodents that love to eat our berries. So in those cases, exclusion is gonna be your best bet. Um, if you can keep them out of there, that's how you're gonna save your strawberries. So I'm gonna stop there. Allison, do we have any questions that didn't get answered in the chat? The only one, Amy, is if you could mention insects and then also any uh, recommendations for growing in containers. I did post some stuff in the chat about day neutrals doing best in containers, but if you have any other insight. Okay, so insects, you know, like I said, strawberries in Colorado typically don't get a lot of insects. Um, occasionally you'll see leaf hoppers, aphids, maybe some slugs. If you have slugs, that's an indication that you have too much water. Um, and then, there, you know, there are some recommendations in the strawberry um, fact sheet that we have from Colorado State of how to deal with some of those insect issues. Um, as far as growing them in containers, again, I would recommend using the day neutral or the ever bearing types um, as opposed to the June bearing. You can use the June bearing, they're just going to produce some runners. You're going to have a little more pruning to do, um, and those will do better for you. Just make sure you're using nice, well drained containers. Um, you can use the strawberry pots. Um, yeah, you can hang, you can do hanging baskets, all kinds of options. Hey, Amy. Um, uh, one of our, our growers for our farmer's market uh, a few years ago had huge problems with spotted winged drosophila mm. on their strawberries yeah. and basically destroyed some of their, their crops. So they just had to pick and, and discard them. Like, like you say, you don't want to leave that stuff on the ground because it just perpetuated the, uh, yeah. the drosophila, but it was a huge problem for them. Yeah, and unfortunately that spotted, if I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, but that spotted wing drosophila, um, it doesn't just go in, set its eggs into ripe fruit. It will actually infect unripe fruit as well. Yes. So inspect your fruit carefully. You might want to cut a few pieces open, make sure there's nothing crawling around in there before you eat. Um, but you know, I'm sure I've had my fair share. I've probably eaten my fair share of spotted wing drosophila back in Kentucky. So I like to call it added protein. <laughs> um, but it can be pretty gross and pretty messy. And so if you have a really big infestation of that, um, there's chemical controls that you can use to help prevent some of that. And then also um, you may consider growing something different. Yeah, the, Amy, this is Allison. The biggest recommendations are to maybe consider picking your fruit slightly underripe, mm -hmm. which is hard, and then yeah. also pick frequently. Those are, and then yeah. refrigerate it right away, which goes against everything we've ever told you about fruit. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm not sure how big of an issue it is yet across the state, um, but I've heard of a few, yeah, a few places here and there that are seeing it. So, and then Amy, there was a question from Andrew about strawberry stands and do they inhibit growth and. I guess, Andrew, I'm not quite sure what a strawberry stand is, but maybe Amy knows. I don't, I don't quite know what that is. Um, okay, Andrew, if you could explain what you want, then we can get you an answer on that. Um, and Peggy, if you, I can type in the name of spotted wing drosophila and you can do a quick Google search to know what that looks like. So thanks, Amy, that's it. Yeah, great, all right, let's move on to raspberries. I got a lot to cover today. Um, so raspberries are in the uh, rubus species, and so we have lots of different types of rubus out there. We've got red raspberries, black raspberries, and purple raspberries, and then there's also many other subspecies of raspberries. Um, you can get white raspberries, golden raspberries, all kinds. Fun stuff. So I know I just talked a lot about June bearing and ever bearing and how these systems are different. I want you to take a deep breath and try to forget what I just taught you about strawberries because we're gonna have a lot of similar terms being thrown at you with raspberries and it can get a little confusing. Um, so try to wipe your brain for just a second and we'll, we'll reset. <laughs> so with raspberries, we have two different types of raspberry canes. 
we have primocanes, which are one-year-old canes, and then we have fluorocanes, which are two-year-old canes. So in this picture here, you can see that those primocanes on the left are kind of shorter. They're very straight and erect and upright. Um, they're also going to be thinner in size. They might be a little bigger than a, maybe a, a pencil or a highlighter in size. When you get to the fluorocanes, those are usually going to be a little taller. They might be branched. They're going to have some fruit set on them. And then they're going to be thicker, um, almost as thick as, uh, thicker than a Sharpie. I don't know how to say that, like the bigger markers. Um, so there's also two different types of raspberries. So we have summer bearing raspberries and we have fall bearing raspberries. The summer bearing raspberries are actually going to fruit on the fluorocanes, but the fall bearing types are gonna fruit on the primocanes, which means they're gonna be first year canes. Um, they're gonna set their canes early. As they grow, they're gonna start fruiting and that's it, they're done in one year. So everbearing red and everbearing yellow are both fall types. The summer types, those fluorocane fruiting ones, their primocanes grow up the first year, they go through the winter dormant, and then in the second year, they start to put on those laterals and they start fruiting on those second year canes. So those types are gonna be your summer black, your summer red, and your summer purple. So again, I just want to make sure it's hard with these to, to go from strawberries to raspberries. A lot of terminology here. All right, so let's start with the summer bearing raspberries because those are kind of the more, um, more typical type of raspberries that we'll see. Um, with these in late winter or early spring, you want to go in and you want to remove all of the dead spent fluorocanes from, the year, from that previous um, season. And you can do this by cutting those back all the way at the ground. You will be able to tell that they are dead. There won't be any red color to the stem anymore. You can kind of see that in the picture here that they've kind of lost, they've lost their look of, of healthiness. So um, go ahead and cut those back to the ground and dispose of those canes because they can often have insects that will bore into the canes and they can also have diseases that you just don't want to leave um, laying around with your, your growing raspberries. Then you want to remove the dead, weak, and small canes and start to thin out that, uh, that patch. And then you want to remove the winter killed tips of the canes that you have left. So if a cane is kind of dead on the top but still okay on the bottom, you can kind of just remove that dead spot. So um, here's a picture just to show you kind of how much they had thinned out this patch. Um, on these summer fruiting red raspberries. So you can see that they're leaving about one cane for every 18 to 24 inches, um, just trying to, to thin out that patch because it can get pretty thick. Um, here you can see um, how they're kind of pruning back those floor canes the next year. Um, as I mentioned, they'll start that second year, they'll start to grow what are called laterals and they'll kind of arch over and hang down. If those laterals hit the soil, a lot of times they'll tip root into the soil. Um, it's actually kind of uh, interesting. You can take those that have tip rooted and dig them out and just cut them back to a few buds and you can use those as new plants. Um, same thing with blackberries. Um, but what you want to do with these floor canes is you want to prune those laterals back um, to about six to eight inches. You just want to reduce the number of buds that are there so that when you do start to get fruit set, there's more energy for less buds. It's gonna give you better, um, better yields. So cut those floor canes back on the laterals to six to eight inches. As far as summer bearing cultivars that do well in Colorado, we've got Nova, Killarney, Boyne, Latham, Newburgh, and Titan are all good varieties for here. The fall bearing, so these are different, managed completely differently. So these are actually, um, raspberries where the, the first year primocanes, when we get to the end of the season, are gonna start producing berries. Um, they're gonna start at the top and they're gonna fruit their way all the way down the cane. You can see in the picture here, um, this is somewhere in Europe, I think, um, but you can see that this, this plant, this fall bearing raspberry plant is fruiting up and down that stem. They're gonna be a lot smaller, typically. Um, you can grow these in containers uh, if you want to. Um, but they might sucker a lot, so just keep that in mind. At the end of the season, 
to give you the best yield. Once they're done fruiting and or flowering and fruiting, you want to go ahead and prune all those canes to the ground in the fall after you harvest. You can actually do this with a lawnmower, although I would I would be for me personally, I think my lawn bla my lawnmower blade may not like it as much. So um, I'd probably just go in with my pruners if your patch isn't too big. But on a large scale production wise, people will just mow these things over and they'll get a new crop the next year. Cause again, it only takes that one year for them to flower and fruit. So fall bearing raspberry types for Colorado. There is a whole list here. Um, I've actually grown some of these back in Kentucky. We grew Anne, which is a yellow fruited kind. Um, it doesn't produce as much fruit, but it's pretty tasty. Uh, we grew some Jacqueline's. Uh, Joan Jay is a nice one that is nearly thornless. And so um, if you've got kids, you might want to consider that, uh, that variety. Heritage, I've grown those before. Um, but yeah, there's just so many that, of the fall bearing types that do well here. And they're probably a little easier um, for the beginning raspberry grower. As far as raspberry culture goes, uh, you want to start with good growing conditions because this patch that you're going to create can last up to 15 years. You want to make sure you plant it in an area with at least eight hours of full sun. And a windbreak is a pretty good idea, especially around uh, this northern Front Range area. It gets so windy. Um, that can just really help out uh, with your plants being happy. Make sure your soil is well drained. Uh, make sure it has good organic matter. These plants really don't like to be planted in poorly drained sites. They, want, they don't want to have their feet wet, but they do want a nice organic soil. Um, don't plant straw, uh, following strawberries, other raspberries, solanaceous crops, vine crops, again for that same reason. These are in the rose family too, and so if you do have any of those soil-borne diseases, um, it can affect your raspberries as well. Irrigation. So with raspberries, they really prefer a light but frequent watering. They're going to need about one to three inches of water per week when the fruits are being formed. Um, drip irrigation is really the best thing for, um, for any of these fruits, but for the raspberries, it's just going to reduce your potential for any diseases. One thing that raspberries are really um, probably going to need is a good trellis system. Um, this is popular for both the summer and the fall bearing type of raspberries, but especially for those fall bearing types, they can get a little uh, tall. Um, they're basically, this system is set up in a T, and so you've got wires about knee height, and that's going to handle your raspberries. Um, it's unlikely that they're going to get to that second post, um, but this, this particular system can also be used for blackberries, and so we'll talk about that in a few slides, but you can see that there's room for them to grow vertically. Um, and then there's that support along the side. Here's another T trellis system. Um, here they've only got the one T, and so you can see just those raspberries really don't grow up too terribly much higher than that, that first wire there. So um, when you're pruning and thinning, again, always make sure you're pruning out those weak canes. If they're smaller than a pencil, um, probably not the strongest. Leave back the ones that are a little bit stronger. And then for those summer bearing types, you wanna make sure you're keeping about 10 canes per four foot row. I mentioned it earlier, but raspberries come in all colors. And so you can get gold ones, black ones. Um, there are purple raspberries out there, but they just don't do quite as well here. So um, we're gonna move into blackberries next, but let's stop real quick. And Allison, do we have any questions on raspberries? Not that we haven't answered. Awesome, great. All right, well in that case, let's um, move into blackberries. So what is the difference between blackberries and raspberries? It's really a pretty subtle difference. Again, they're all in that rubus family. But blackberries, when you pick them, are gonna retain the receptacle inside, whereas the raspberries are gonna be hollow on the inside. Blackberries generally tend to be a little bit larger in size. Um, but that can be variety specific. There are a few blackberry and red raspberry hybrids out there. So you may have heard of some of these. Um, they are generally considered more blackberries because the receptacle does come off with the fruit. So boysenberries, loganberries, and tayberries. Um, 
you know, these aren't as commonly grown in Colorado. There's just some questions about their hardiness and water needs. So I'm not going to cover much more about those, but I do want to focus in a little bit on blackberries. So blackberries are in the uh, genus Rubus, Rubus fruticosus. And there's just like raspberries and just like strawberries, there's different types of blackberries as well. Um, you want to be selecting here in Colorado either erect blackberries or semi-erect blackberries. There's another category which are the trailing blackberries, but those are just not hardy in Colorado because they do get killed off when it gets pretty cold. The erect blackberries uh, are going to have a stiff arching cane. They're going to be somewhat self-supporting, um, but I still would recommend a trellis with even the erect type of blackberries. Um, these might be killed in the fluctuating springtime weather. They're, they're typically just a little less hardy. Um, they're usually thornly, thorny, excuse me, but there are a few thornless types of erect blackberries out there. Semi-erect blackberries are probably more popular in my opinion. Um, these are typically thornless and um, it should say trellising on the semi-erect is definitely required. So as far as the erect blackberry cultivars for Colorado, Prime Jan and Prime Jim both do well. I will say this, I grew these in Kentucky. These do well across the United States. They're really the two main, in my opinion, the two main types of erect blackberries you, that are being grown in the United States. As far as the semi-erect, Triple Crown and Chester, I also grew these in Kentucky. So again, a wide range of where you can grow these and they're gonna be pretty, uh, pretty reliable here in Colorado. Uh, Triple Crown have massive berries, um, probably almost the size of a ping pong ball if they're really, really happy, which is just crazy. Really good. And again, thornless, um, the, both I think, I don't know about the Chester, but the Triple Crown is definitely a thornless cultivar. All right, planting blackberries. So think back to the um, summer bearing raspberries, how they grow up in the first year and then the second year they're going to set those floor canes. These grow in a really similar fashion. They're just kind of on a bigger scale. So with the erect cultivars of blackberries, the spacing, you're going to need about two to three feet between plants. Whereas the semi-erect, you're going to need five to six feet between plants because they just take up a lot Again, a lot of space. Um, a trellis system is definitely recommended for the semi-erect. Um, so yeah, cultural needs are gonna be similar to raspberries in terms of fertilizers, um, irrigation, and planting. Here you can see a blackberry trellis. Um, I think a second level of, of wire would, would definitely be helpful in this case, um, but you wanna use that two wire system with one wire at 18 inches above the first wire. So if you put one, say, between knee and waist high, then put another one about a foot and a half higher. We have a garden note on this, um, on pruning and everything. It's 762, and I'll show these again at the end of the, the talk. So with pruning, as I mentioned, it's very similar to that um, summer, uh, summer bearing raspberry, where you're going to have those canes with laterals on them. And so you want to cut those laterals back um, in the early spring, late winter, and you're going to be cutting with blackberries. Again, they're on a larger scale. So instead of six to eight inch laterals, you want to probably have about, oh, maybe 12 inch laterals. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is what I'm referring to when I'm referring to a lateral in the upper picture, in the picture here on the upper corner. All right, any questions before I move on to blueberries about blackberries? We are still good. Doing great, okay, good deal. Let's talk about blueberries. <laughs> um, so blueberries, a lot of people consider them like the holy grail of small fruit. Um, and I think that must be a Colorado thing because they're so hard to grow here. Um, <laughs> people here really want to grow, ro ro uh, grow blueberries, but there's a lot of things we have to consider. The main thing is our soil pH and our soil alkalinity. Um, we have high pH soils, high alkalinity, and that's just not what blueberries prefer. Um, they also don't like to be in super heavy clay um, or even sandy soils. They really like a nice, rich, loamy soil. 
Again, something that we just don't find a lot here in Colorado. Um, they also take a lot of water. They're not a, um, they're definitely not a xeric type of fruit. And so our arid climate tends to dry them out a lot. Um, and then we get hit with those cold temperatures in the winter and those big fluctuations and you know, you name it, everything is kind of working against us when it comes to growing blueberries. So um, again, very difficult to grow here. If you do try to grow blueberries, this is not a set it and forget it type of plant. You really have to commit to making that growing, those growing conditions perfect for that plant. And never will you ever grow blueberries in native soil in Colorado. Now, I know there's probably somebody out there who's gonna challenge me on this and say, I have a blueberry bush growing in my backyard and it's doing just fine. But my question to you would be, how much fruit do you really get off of that bush? <laughs> because chances are, it's just not gonna be happy enough to be a big producer. I'm not gonna say it's 100%, but it's pretty good, pretty good bet. Um, this picture was taken in Virginia. Um, I think this is, uh, from one of their extension um, services there. And you can see that even in Virginia where they have the perfect soil for blueberries, they're still using a lot of soil amendment to make them happy. So if you do wanna try to grow blueberries in Colorado, you have to grow them in an acidic substrate like peat moss. So in the picture here, you can see this is what we call a peat moss bale. Um, it's, it's usually several bags of peat moss like you would typically buy in, at the hardware store, but they're compressed. So it's a compressed bale of peat moss. Um, you need to keep that root zone very moist all year long, even through the winter. And it's not going to be easy because you're going to be moving these probably inside in the winter as well because that is not planted in the ground. And so you're going to end up um, having your root zone frozen if you leave that out. You also have to protect the top of the shrubs from wind um, so they don't dry out. You can wrap them with burlap. You can put sheets over them during the dormant period. But again, if you're going to leave them outside, you need to actually plant that peat moss, peat moss bale in the ground so the root system doesn't freeze. And then you can't just do this with one plant. You actually need two different varieties for good cross-pollination. And I didn't mention it before, but there are also different types of blueberries. There's high bush blueberries, low bush blueberries, and rabbit eye. Um, here in Colorado, if you're going to try this, I would choose a high bush blueberry. Um, those are the types we also grew in Kentucky. They're just a little bit more winter hardy. Um, the low bush are what come from Maine, and they're actually tiny little blueberries compared to the high bush, which are pretty good size, maybe the size of a dime or even a nickel or more. So are blueberries really practical? It depends on who you ask, but I would not recommend these for the beginning gardener. Um, it's probably gonna be cheaper for you to be like Allison and go buy your fruit at Costco or, or, or wherever you shop for your groceries um, when they're on sale. The plants don't produce high volumes of fruit if they fruit um, when they're grown in containers like this or when they're grown in the peat bales. Um, again, they're not water wise and water is something we're, we're concerned about here in Colorado. So um, essentially you'd be growing your blueberries in a container like this if you were going to do that. So, and then think long term, you know, eventually that root system is going to outgrow that container. You'll get circling roots and then you'll have stressed plants. So um, there are other small fruits that are easier to grow than blueberries. Um, they need less water, less maintenance, and can be just as satisfying. And so in the next section, we'll look at currants, gooseberries, and grapes. Um, I also wanted to mention service berries. Um, those are great ornamental plants that you can also harvest for fruit. Um, a good one is Saskatoon, and that's what's in the picture that you see in front of you. So any questions on blueberries? Or Allison, have you been discouraging everyone in the chat? Uh, you know, there are no questions because I think you did a great job, but I will just reiterate <laughs> that, guys, blueberries are not for the typical Colorado gardener. I, I would really strongly recommend that you do not grow them, but focus on something that you will have success with. Yes, maybe one of these next ones we're gonna talk about. Yes. All right, so let's move into the ribes species. So these are gonna be things like currants, gooseberries and josta berries. They're actually woody perennial shrubs that can get anywhere from three to six feet in height and width. 
Um, most of these are going to be what we call self fruitful. So unlike the blueberries I just mentioned, where you have to have two different um, two different varieties to get good pollination, you don't need that with these types. They're going to you can actually um, get good pollination from even the same plant, the same bush. So you don't need those multiple varieties, which is great. Um, also. Currants are easily grown at higher elevations, so all the way up to 10,000 feet. So if you're up there in the mountains, you probably see a lot of these growing around you in nature anyway. And so just know that that's a great environment for them. So give these a shot. So let's start with the black currants. Um, these are really great for jellies and pastries, and they're very high in vitamin C. And so some good varieties of black currants are Allegan, which is in the picture here, Ben Nevis, Broad, uh, I'm sorry, Broadtrop, Consort, and Crusader, all good black currant varieties. There's also red currants. These are going to be a little bit more tart, and so they're better suited for jellies. Um, red currant jelly, I'm, I'm kind of weird, is like one of my favorite kinds of jellies, and it's so hard to find. Um, they quit selling it at my local grocery store. I now have to order it online. <laughs> so if you want to start a business growing red currants, um, I don't know, I would, I would certainly buy them. <laughs> All right, so some good red currant varieties for here in Colorado. The probably the most popular type that we see grown are the Red Lake, and they have kind of a mild flavor. Um, then we have Wilder, which is another good type for Colorado. These are going to have larger cl uh, clusters than the Red Lake, um, but you know, overall, again, also very tart. Um, but there's Cherry, Red Currants, Perfection, um, and several others that you can grow as well. We also have White Currants, and so on the list here prior, um, White Grape and White Imperial, these actually fall into the White Currant group. These are the sweetest of the currants. Um, great for fresh eating. Um, not to be mistaken with golden currants or clove currants. Those are, those are kind of a whole different thing. Um, white currants are actually red currants that were selected out for a more pale color. So really pretty as well. So also in this Ribes species um, group, we have gooseberries. These are also going to be self-fruitful. There are two different types. We have European types and American types. The European types are susceptible to powdery mildew. Um, the American types probably grow better here, and so um, I would recommend those. And they're gonna be a little bit more tart. Um, the difference between gooseberries and currants, gooseberries are gonna be a lot bigger in size, so up to a half inch, um, whereas those currants are pretty, pretty tiny, maybe the, like the, maybe the tip of a pencil eraser. Um, also, the gooseberries, if I didn't say it already, are born singly on the stem, whereas the uh, currants are more born in clusters. Um, gooseberries and currants can both um, tolerate really poor soils, which is, again, great. That's why they're so, so easily grown here in Colorado, because, you know, we have poor soil. <laughs> um, but yeah, so try out some gooseberries as well. Here's some cultivars that do well in our, in our state. So Comanche, um, Hinamaki Yellow, Welcome, Hinamaki Red, Invicta, and Pixwell are all good acceptable varieties. Um, the Pixwell that you see in the picture, those are about half inch size berries that start out kind of that light green and they mature to a nice soft pink color. The Welcome that's on the list, those are gonna be a little sweeter, um, darker, and they're gonna have less thorns than this Pixwell variety. So that makes those that welcome a little bit easier to pick. Maybe that's why they called them welcome, like welcome come harvest me. <laughs> um, the Hinamaki Red, those are gonna be small dark red berries and they have a pretty good flavor. And then the Invicta are a little different. Um, those have pear-shaped berries and um, it's reported they have excellent flavor. I have not tried the Invicta. Ones that you wanna stay away from are the Downing and the Colossal. And then in this, this group of plants, we have the Josta berries. And so these are actually a hybrid of gooseberry and black currants. Um, they're nearly black in color, larger berries. Um, and so with the Josta berries, unlike the currants and the gooseberries, they actually do better with fruit production if you plant both 
the black types and the red types. So they like that cross-pollination. Um, you want to harvest these when they're fully colored, when they have a nice soft texture, and that goes for all of these in this um, Ribes family. So as far as planting these types of small fruits, you want to plant these in early spring. Uh, make sure you give them some space. They're going to need about three and a half to four and a half feet between plants. Loosen the soil. Um, it's just going to help them establish a little bit better. Um, so loose soil is great. Uh, I would stay away from really hard compacted um, clay type soils, although I say they can do well in poor soils. I don't think very many plants at all can do well in compacted soils. So again, you might want to loosen that soil up just a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, they do really well at higher elevations. And so um, they actually prefer full sun at higher elevations. But because it gets so hot down here along the front range, you can grow these in part shade and that'll help keep them a little happier. So at elevation, full sun's okay, but down here um, on the front range, if you're down here, yeah, give them a little bit of shade. They're very hardy. Um, some of these to zone three. You want to head back the branches when you plant these things to five inches, and that's going to help. Um, you're just going to leave a few buds back. That's going to help you get a bush uh, style or habit to that plant. And just know that some of these also have ornamental qualities, so this is a great opportunity to kind of mix in your edible um, plants and with your ornamental plants into your landscape. So you don't have to have a current bed, a current bush bed or gooseberry bed. You can mix these in with your landscape. As far as pruning goes, um, just to touch on this, um, you want to prune these in late winter, early spring, like all the rest of these fruits we've mentioned today, um, prior to those buds swelling. I always like to say with your fruit, um, with, your, with your woody plants, um, you always want to prune them, except for those that are flowering shrubs that flower in the early spring. Everything else you want to prune it while it's asleep. Um, it's kind of like having surgery. You don't want to have surgery while you're awake. Plants don't want to be pruned while they're awake, so do it when they're sleeping. Again, there are exceptions to that. So prune them in late winter, early spring, prior to those buds swelling. You want to um, prune back um, some of this wood because these bear fruit on old wood that's usually two to three years old. So you want to remove the wood that's more than three years old and then thin out some of that younger wood. So if you look at the picture here, you can see some numbers on these stems and that's telling you the age of that stem. So we've got three one-year-old stems, three two-year-old stems, and then three that are three years old. So that's just one way for you to kind of um, think about how to prune these and get the maximum fruit production. Um, gooseberries are gonna be a little bit different with those. Uh, you wanna leave more of the one-year um, canes that come up because on gooseberries, the one-year canes are pretty fruitful. And so leave more that are young. If you prune these right and you keep these bushes healthy, they can remain productive for up to 20 years and give you pretty good yields. So any questions on, and I'll, I'll do my best on the currants, gooseberries, uh, josta berries. I have to be honest, I've not grown these, um, although I love to eat them. <laughs> but what do we have as far as questions? Anything? No, but there was an offer from Patty that you are welcome to her currants. Oh, okay. Patty, is, Pat, is that Patty in Weld? Um, I don't know if she's in Weld. All right, well, I'll she can, to tell me. She can contact you with her offer of, I think she was, awesome. it sounded like the bushes. Um, it doesn't, no questions, just Courtney wants to know what family are choke cherries in? Those are in the prunus family. So in the cherry family. Yep. Um, and it is Patty and Weld, yes. Great, Patty and Weld, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, we got about a half hour left. Um, I'm going to move into the grapes now. So it, it sounds like we might actually finish a little early. So um, we'll take some more questions at the end if something else comes to mind. All right. So grapes. So these are in the vitis species. So uh, we have two main types of grapes. We've got table grapes and we've got wine grapes. And really, um, I've always been, I've always managed these the same way, um, but there are some differences between how they look. So table grapes are typically going to be a lot larger than wine grapes. Uh, wine grapes tend to have a really thick skin, 
Um, there are seedless table grapes. There are also seeded table grapes, um, but the wine grapes typically are gonna have seeds in them. So um, just some differences in, in the way the fruit looks, tastes, and feels. So when you're selecting a site and preparing a site for growing grapes, um, you wanna make sure you do the following things. You don't wanna plant your grapes in your lawn. Um, grapes like a drier soil, they like to have drier conditions, and so your lawn irrigation is, is just gonna not make your, happy, your grapes very happy. So avoid the lawn. You wanna pick a nice gently rolling terrain. Um, a lot of that has to do with frost pockets. Um, as we all, as you learn from uh, grade school, warm air rises, cold air sinks. And so um, you wanna have that rolling terrain to let the cold air kind of roll down the, the side of the um, hill so that it doesn't pocket around the plants. A lean soil is good. They don't like a heavily amended, a high organic matter soil. They can really grow in a nice lean soil. Again, drier conditions as well. Um, go ahead and do a soil test before you start planting your grapes. These are a long-term plant, just like the rest of these, and that goes for all of these small fruits. Um, get to know your soil before you plant, and make sure you space these appropriately. So when you are planting your grapes, you're going to be planting bare root plants in the spring. And so you can see from the picture there, that's what um, this person's holding up. It's just a bundle of those bare-rooted um, bare plants. You want to soak these roots for about three hours. Um, it's just going to really help give you better establishment. I also did this when I planted raspberries. Um, and then with the strawberries I planted, I didn't soak them for that long, but I definitely wet the roots for a good 15, 20 minutes before I planted those as well. Soaking those roots before you plant these woody plants like this can just really help them establish a little better and then not go through as much transplant shock. So you wanna plant your depths at the depth that they grew in the nursery. So you're gonna to have to look closely to find out where the, the roots stop and the stem starts and try to keep it right at that level. You wanna space these at least six to eight feet apart. Um, I've actually seen them even spaced further than that. Um, you definitely have to set up some sort of trellising system immediately because those canes will grow fast the first year and at the end of that first year you're going to want to be, um, you're going to want to already have a cane tied up to the trellis. After you plant these, um, after planting the strongest cane, um, you're going to, I'm sorry there's a, a typo on here, you want to cut that back to two to three strong buds and remove all the other canes um, that, that do pop up around it that sucker from it. So here are some pictures of some trellis systems for you. Um, basically, you wanna have one, two, or three tightly stretched wires that are secured firmly to some end posts. And so the picture on the far right there is kind of showing that, that system. You can also use arbors. Um, those will definitely work as well, although a, a little higher investment. Um, those are usually more used in an ornamental fashion. Um, but either way you slice it, it has to be substantial enough to carry the weight of these vines. A cluster of grapes is pretty heavy, and so you want to make sure that it's got something really nice to grab a hold on. Um, you can even go up higher in terms of the wires. Um, you can grow these a little tighter um, spacing like the picture at the bottom there. Um, you want to make sure you have turnbuckles at the end of the wire so that you can um, use a ratchet type thing and, and tighten those up from time to time. Um, you don't want wires that are kind of uh, have a, a slack in them. You want to make sure they're nice and taut. So um, a little bit about training and pruning grapes. So you can see in the picture here the different structures that, um, that are on a grape plant. Um, these are usually grafted, and so you'll see that bulging graft union at the base of the trunk. Anything that comes up below that graft union, those are suckers, and those are not going to give you the same type of grape back typically. So go ahead and cut those off at the base. What you can do is choose um, one of the, the canes that come out above the graft union and kind of hold it back for insurance. Um, this is something we used to do um, in Kentucky where we would just let one little cane at the bottom kind of go in case we lost one of our main <coughs> ones. 
A little further up on the trunk there, you'll see uh, the cordon. So we're training two canes that go outward. And then off of that cordon, you get new canes and new shoots, and then what we call spurs. Um, there's a lot of different systems. It would probably take me another two hours to go through all the different types of grape pruning systems and methods. Um, so I just want to kind of touch on it here and say that the cordon training spur pruning is the best system for our area. And that's what you can see in both that top picture and then the bottom picture where they have a double layer. This is called a double curtain. Um, just one cordon on each side would be called a single curtain system. So here you can see this single, this is like a single curtain system, two cordons going off in either direction. Um, and then off of that, those cordons, you'll get these spurs and that's where you're gonna be pruning to get new growth. So the cordons are the arms. The spurs are the shoots from last year that hold the buds for this year. Um, so you can see a picture of the grape bud here. This is what you're going to be looking at and you're going to want to try to only leave a couple of these buds per spur when you do your pruning in early spring. There's an inverse relationship that is happening between the bud count and the amount of fruit production you get. Um, you can get pretty technical with this. There's actually mathematical formulas that have been um, proven through research, um, but just know if you just cut those spurs back to where you've only got two buds per spur, you're going to be in pretty good shape. So here you can see um, where your pruning is important. You want to actually, unlike a lot of other times where we tell you to go ahead and prune back pretty close to a bud, um, grapes tend to die back a lot um, in those cordons or those, those stems. So you actually want to cut these right in the middle between the nodes you are gonna get some drying out of that stem and we just don't want it to dry down further than where the bud is. So um, this is the one time I'll tell you to, to prune right in the middle and leave a stub back. As those grapes get older, those spurs are just gonna start to look more and more gnarled. And so just know that this is normal. Um, and every year you can see that they're pruning back to two buds. So over time, your grapes can look, again, pretty crazy. So let's talk a little bit about some different cultivars. Um, there's a lot of different cultivars that we can grow for table grapes here in Colorado. Um, Concord is probably one of the most well-known and grown widely across the United States. Um, that's your typical, excuse me, your typical Concord grape jelly. Niagara is actually, I think it has a very similar flavor to Concord, but it's a white grape. Um, St. Teresa is one that we grow here a lot. Um, I think this one is also a plant select plant, proven to do well in our climate. Um, I've also grown Reliance, um, and then there were some other ones I grew back in Kentucky. Um, well, I should say the university grew. I didn't grow them personally, but, um, and those were like Mars, Neptune. So you might see those thrown around as well. I think those are better suited for the, the Eastern United States than here. You may be wanting to grow some wine grapes. Um, I love wine. Uh, wine grapes are typically gonna be smaller in size. The flavor of wine grapes is much more concentrated. They're probably gonna be a little more sour tasting, more tart um, than your table grapes when they're ripe. They're gonna be seeded, um, and then they're also, again, gonna have that thicker skin. Wine grapes in Colorado, um, we have some issues with them. Most of these are grown on the western slope, um, but we do see some wine growers here in the Front Range. Um, I was just driving uh, down toward Boulder last week and I saw a, uh, just a small property, probably just a few acres, and they had wine grapes uh, growing in the front yard, which was great. The hybrids are going to do better for you along the front range in terms of wine grapes. They're just going to be more hardy and handle our winter temperatures better. Um, they do tend to produce the sweeter wines, and I'm going to go through a little bit more on this in the next few slides. So if you like red wine and you want to try yourself some wine grapes, um, here's some varieties that are re recommended from CSU. Um, Cobb Franc, St. Croix, Deshaunac, Chancellor, Chamberson, um, which I've tried Chamberson and it's very tasty. 
Um, and then the Marichal folk, folk likes the sandy soil and then Pinot Noir, probably not the best one for here, although a popular wine to drink. Um, then in terms of the white wines, we've got Aurora, Gewürztraminer, um, Saval Blanc, Vidal Blanc. Um, Vignol is a, I personally really like Vignol and that's what's in the picture here. You've probably not heard of a lot of these types of wine grapes. Um, and that's okay. We, you know, we hear about the French grapes a lot. Um, Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay. And it's just because that's where, you know, wine, wine comes from Europe typically. Here in the United States, when we're growing these French American hybrids, like the ones I just named off, they're typically selling these as sweet white wine or sweet red wine <laughs> or something like that. So you're not, you're just not getting exposed to the names as much. But you know, it all tastes good, and if they grow better, I would I would definitely grow the hybrids, the French American hybrids, before I would grow those typical um, European grapes. So, just closing up our grape discussion, um, there are some problems that we have with grapes. They do not like poor drainage. Again, they like it a little bit more dry. Um, Check your vines at purchase. Sometimes they may not be of good quality. You might want to rogue out those ones that aren't looking so hot when you first buy them. Um, plant early enough. You definitely don't want to wait too late in the season. We want to make sure they have time to grow up and reach that, at least that first trellis wire. Um, irrigation is important. It likes nice consistent irrigation, but again, not over irrigating. Definitely not for the lawn situation. And then we need to make sure with our grapes that we're controlling those weeds and then always scouting for diseases. Um, they can definitely get a few here in Colorado. Um, all right, any questions on grapes? No questions on grapes, unless you're muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> Courtney does, no questions on grapes, but just, general recommendations of where to purchase berry plants? Do you, would you recommend nurseries or is mail order better? What do you think? Okay, so um, local nurseries are great because they're, they already are sourcing these things from places that they know are, are pretty reliable. Um, your local nurseries, especially the ones that have been around for a while, they've been selling this stuff and they know what works. So I would start there if you're a beginner. Um, and go with what they've got. So I went to my local nursery, like I said a few weeks ago, they had one kind of strawberry plant, I bought it. And it was the Everbearing. I don't even know what variety it was. Um, if you're gonna start to go into the mail order, mail order type catalogs where you're looking for more unique varieties or things, you know, you're, maybe you're not a beginner anymore and you wanna try something new, um, just look for those um, places that are have nurseries that are at northern locations. Um, also, again, always check the zone on these, and I like to just go ahead and go down a zone from where you are and what your typical hardiness zone map tells you, subtract a zone. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can get these things from all over the place. Um, you can find them a lot of times at your big box stores. Um, you know, usually we say check your local nurseries. Um, but you know, if something's on clearance, I'm a sucker for a good clearance <laughs> fruit bush. <laughs> so, you know, you can always try it out, but just know that um, you may not have as good an, a, a success with it. There was a question from Deborah about, she wants to grow raspberries more as a hedge. Do you have any recommendations? And then also, are any of these fruits not good for dogs? And I can think of grapes, but if you have other, resources they need. Okay, we'll start with the hedge question. I'm not really sure how to answer this because I think everyone's interpretation of a hedge is different. Um, if you were to grow the fall bearing raspberries as a hedge, you would have a hedge only in the summer. <laughs> and then you would cut that hedge down every, you know, once they're done um, fruiting. So I, I don't know that the fall bearing would be the best for a hedge. The summer bearing could be used for a hedge, but it's gonna be a thin hedge. Um, you could let it kind of get a little more wild with the summer bearing type raspberries. Again, you're gonna have those one-year-old canes happening, those two-year-old fruiting canes happening. Um, 
but if you really wanted it more as a screen, I would just maybe not prune out as many canes. Keep in mind that's going to give you less fruit production as well. So if you're growing it, it just depends on what you're growing it for. If it's in that more ornamental situation, then I would say summer bearing and maybe not pruning as much. What was the second question? <laughs> um, fruits and dogs. Oh, fruits and dogs. Oh man, you know, I don't necessarily feel comfortable answering that question. Um, I do know that grapes are really bad for dogs. Um, I've actually had an experience where a, one of my dogs ate a grape. This was several years ago. Um, and it, it just caused some major issues. They can have kidney issues with it. Um, so no grapes for dogs. Um, other than that though, I don't know if I feel comfortable answering all those because I'm not sure on the currants and the gooseberries. Um, I think strawberries are okay, but CSU has a veterinary website where you can go and look, um, look at poisonous plants for animals. Um, and I'll see if I can find that website and maybe I can send that out um, when I send out your resources. But grapes are bad. Grape, grapes are definitely bad. Um, you know, I think we are caught up. There was a question about bindweed in the garden, which I just answered. Good. And I don't know if there's other questions. We're happy to, to take them at this time. Okay, I have um, just one more slide here to show. Um, I had started to make a list of all the different fact sheets and plant talks that CSU offers on small fruits. And then I quickly realized that this is already housed on one nice little website for you. So um, if you go to the Master Gardener CSU website under um, gardening information, you'll find online publications and then you'll find small fruits. And if you go to that link, which I will also include in my um, notes to you after class, uh, but you can find fact sheets, plant talks about all the different fruits that we talked about today. Um, there's also a Colorado grape growers guide for those of you that want to grow grapes. It's like 80 some pages of grape information, <laughs> like my pun there. Um, but yeah, there are tons of resources from CSU. CSU Extension has some great resources to help you grow small fruits in Colorado. Be sure to check out our Master Gardener webpage. There you'll find lots of information about many different types of small fruits all in one place. Also look for our Plant Talk articles. These are short and to the point. We also offer CSU Extension fact sheets, which are gonna give you just a little bit more information. And if you really wanna take a deep dive into growing small fruits, check out our Master Gardener garden notes. Thank you for joining me for this video. If you have more questions, contact your local CSU Extension office or check out our website at extension.colostate.edu.